All right, so failure to thrive was originally used to identify abnormal growth and development patterns in children. And in the 1970s, this term was borrowed from pediatrics to describe a similar syndrome affecting older adults. It is a diagnosis used in hospice care. There is little research in recent literature on geriatric failure to thrive. So it's not, ger geriatric failure to thrive is not a single disease or medical condition. It is multidimensional and it requires a multidimensional approach for its treatment. Please know that it is not part of normal aging. Um, there are many um, proponents for getting rid of this term failure to thrive for geriatrics. Um, and what we're seeing in some of the literature now is the term geriatric syndromes. So one of the articles that is on reserve is actually, um, it's a landmark article on uh, geriatric syndrome. So, so please do um, look at those articles. All right, so definitions. Um, undesired weight loss um, in the elderly causes a reduced quality of life and contributes to serious illness. Elderly residents, residents of nursing facilities who lose 5% of their body weight in one month are actually four to six times more likely to die within a year. Um, poor prognosis is also associated with low prealbumin and cholesterol levels. Malnutrition in the elderly can result in pressure sores, functional decline, longer rehab, and multiple medical conditions. And it is projected that by 2060, older adults, that's people who are 65 and older, will account for 21.9% of the population. And there will also be an increase in the oldest old. And, and the oldest old is actually defined as those that are 85 years and older. So when we look at definitions, it's weight loss of more than 5%. It's decreased appetite, poor nutrition, and physical inactivity that's often associated with dehydration, depression, immune dysfunction, and low cholesterol. And this is an Institute of Medicine um, definition for geriatric failure to thrive. It's a multidimensional problem, like I mentioned earlier, with four chief characteristics. You have impaired physical function. You have malnutrition, which is the key pathophysiologic component of uh, geriatric failure to thrive. You have depression. And the fourth characteristic is a cognitive impairment. Extensive diagnostic workups are often prescribed, and actually 25 to 35 percent of uh, geriatric failure to thrive patients have no obvious medical cause for their weight loss. Um, Egbert, 1996, has um, presented um, this concept, the 11 Ds of the dwindles. And um, the 11 Ds are um, possible precipitants of failure to thrive and the most common diseases that are associated with failure to thrive are cancer, heart failure, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little more depth. But so you have physical disease could be one uh, possible precipitant or underlying issue with geriatric failure to thrive. You have dementia, dementia which has been noted in 40% of uh, geriatric failure to thrive patients. So, um, it's also important to do careful screening for alcohol and substance abuse. That's really important. And I want you to make sure that you understand the differences between dementia and delirium, okay? Um, delirium is a sudden or abrupt change in one's mental status, and typically um, there is an underlying cause for that. It is an emergent situation. Okay, whereas dementia is more of an insidious process of cognitive decline. Okay, you also want to bear in mind sensory deficits that can lead to social withdrawal and isolation. Desertion through death, indifference, or relocation of family and friends is, is um, something that is, uh, does occur with that older adult. And um, so you need to keep that in mind. D 
destitution is can be an issue from a low uh, socioeconomic status, um, limited access to um, resources, which could affect your diet, your your ability to buy medications, your ability to get to the pharmacy because you can't drive anymore, and so on. And then despair is actually the loss of the will to live. So these are some interesting um, precipitants of geriatric failure to thrive that you need to just be mindful of. Just I just want to touch on geriatric syndromes, which is kind of the new buzzword now. And geriatric syndrome is a multifact or multifactorial health conditions that occur when the accumulated effects of impairments in multiple systems render an older person vulnerable to situational challenges. And so um, geriatric, geriatric syndromes pose some special clinical considerations. There are multiple risk factors and multiple organ systems are often involved. Um, diagnostic strategies to identify the underlying causes can be ineffective, burdensome, dangerous, and costly. And then therapeutic management of clinical manifestations can be helpful even in the absence of firm diagnosis or clarification of underlying causes. So some of the syndromes we have here, and you know, it, sometimes it's really hard to tease these out in an individual because an individual could have a number of these. So you have cognitive impairment, constipation, pain, falls, pressure ulcers, incontinence, functional decline, adverse drug events, malnutrition, and dehydration. So it's important to, to bear this in mind when you're taking care of your older adults. So we talked earlier about physical disease being a, pre, a precipitant of geriatric failure to thrive. And these are some common medical conditions that if a person has these that can um, really accelerate geriatric failure to thrive. So of course cancer mets and you have malnutrition and cancer cachexia. Any underlying chronic disease like respiratory failure, renal failure, hepatic failure, cardiac failure, and diabetes, they can all affect um, absorption. Um, with diabetes, you can have poor glucose homeostasis. And of course, with all of these, you have end organ damage. Depression or any other psychiatric disorder can affect one's functional status and one's um, nutritional status. Hip or other large bone fractures can impair functional ability, which can uh, result in poor nutrition. If the person can't get up there to, to make themselves something to eat, maybe they're eating um, a lot of junk food because it has high fat, which leads to satiety um, and so on. And then chronic inflammation with um, any of the rheumatological diseases um, and any inflammatory bowel disease, of course, this can affect absorption and, and nutrition. Previous GI surgery, again, that can affect malabsorption, malnutrition. Chronic infection, uh, any recurrent UTI or pneumonia, um, that can affect someone's functional ability. And TB, of course, or any other systemic infection can really alter a person's functional ability. Stroke is another common medical condition where you can start to see geriatric failure to thrive. You have some swallowing problems as a result of stroke. You may have depression because of the loss of function. Um, and, and you also could have some cognitive loss because of the, the stroke, um, leaving some cognitive deficits. Medication use also can, can affect um, one's nutritional status. How many times have you, as students, in your side effects seen nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea as very common side effects? And so this can, this can alter um, someone's ability to um, maintain proper calories. So medication use, I want to talk about, and these are some of the common drugs that are associated with geriatric failure to thrive. Uh, um, the anticholinergic drugs are the biggies. 
um, because they can lead to cognitive changes, altered taste. They can lead to dry mouth, and someone just may not enjoy their food anymore. So they're, they're not going to be taking in enough calories. The anti-epileptic anti drugs can certainly affect one's cognition. The patient may not remember that they've got to eat. Um, and that can also lead to anorexia or loss of appetite. The benzodiazepines can, can result in anorexia, depression, and cognition, cognitive changes. And <clears throat> just to bear in mind, in the older adult, benzodiazepines can hang around. Their effects can hang around for quite a bit, okay? So you have a longer half-life. They do stay, the effects stay in the body a lot longer. Beta blockers can also result in cognitive changes and some depression. Your central alpha antagonists can, again, lead to anorexia, depression, and cognition changes. And diuretics, of course, we know they can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. The glucocorticosteroids, um, again, that can certainly affect geriatric failure to thrive. It can actually result in elevated blood sugars. Typically, typically those steroids can tend to actually promote one's appetite um, in some cases. If a person, a polypharmacy, which is defined as greater than four prescribed medications, and we see that a lot in older adults, okay, that so you can have drug interactions that would interfere um, and can cause anorexia and nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And um, neuroleptics also can cause anorexia and lead to Parkinson's-like um, symptoms. Opioids, of course, can result um, in anorexia, cognition changes also. Your SSRIs can lead to anorexia, and your tricyclic antidepressants can alter taste, result in dry mouth, and more cognition changes. So as nurses, it's really important that we do thorough assessments. So a physical assessment would be think about what um, you would do in a physical assessment. You, of course, do height and weight. You also want to calculate their BMI. If, if you are able to and you have the equipment, you can certainly do the tricep skin fold measurements, calf measurements do a full set of vital signs, and oxygen saturation would be important. Laboratory evaluation, which is typically ordered by your physician or your nurse practitioner, but typically are ordered um, to evaluate. Now, uh, just a caveat, it is important to refrain from ordering unnecessary tests that would not benefit the patient. And typically, initial lab tests to evaluate unintentional weight loss would include a CBC a chemistry po profile. They'd want to look at thyroid function. And in cancer patients, they're looking for a carcinoembryonic antigen. You'd probably want to do a UA with culture and maybe a fecal occult blood test if that's indicated, if the patient is showing some signs of a potential GI bleed. Further tests really should be guided by the results of that initial, the initial lab um, evaluation that I just mentioned. Also, um, you, you, you look at history, physical exam, and the patient's wishes. <clears throat> Excuse me, more extensive testing could include a chest x-ray, a PSA, nutritional markers, particularly looking at vitamin D and vitamin B complex. Um, you'd certainly want to work a patient up for anemia, and that's what your CBC is looking at. Drug levels, you want maybe if a person's on dilantin or digoxin, they could be, have some toxicity there. You also want to be looking at prealbumin and albumin levels. You're going to be looking at physical function, you know, um, using maybe the CATS um, activities of daily living scale or the Lawton um, instrumental activities of daily living scale. You want to do a malnutrition, and, and we do a mini nutritional assessment scale. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but <coughs> excuse me, they're important um, assessments to make. You also you want to be looking for depression. You would use the geriatric depression scale for that for your assessment. You're going to be doing a cognitive impairment 
and that would be your me mini mental. Um, you could also do a mini cog, which is the drawing of the clock and the three word um, evaluation. And looking at medication use in particularly, you want to be looking at the beers criteria. And <coughs> I don't know if you all know what that is, but the beers criteria really quickly is a two part assessment. The first part is really looking at medications that an older adult is on that really are not recommended for someone over 65. And you just compare the meds to the list. So you're looking at the medication itself and also looking at dosing. And typically, if you see a medication that's on a beers list, you need to talk with a physician about whether um, there's an alternative, something that doesn't have um, high risk, okay? And then the second part of the beers criteria is really if a patient has a particular condition and they should not be on certain medications. That's beers in a nutshell. If you wanted more information on that, you can go to Consult Jerry, so it's C-O-N-S-U-L-T, Jerry, G-E-R-I-R-N.com, I think it's dot com, um, and they have a lot of information on there about um, these assessments for the older adult. And also looking at advanced direct directives, you really want to clarify with the patient and the family what their goals are for care because you know they may not want to undergo all of these diagnostic tests. So it really depends on what their goals are. So nursing management, of course, you do want to call a family conference. It is important to further discuss medical care and treatment, and a frank discussion is needed if further medical care would only prolong the inevitable, okay? You're, you're asking about advanced directives in your family conference. Um, you want to talk about the patient family concerns and they should be addressed. And the goals of all parties should really be understood by the end of the meeting. Another area of nursing management would be nutritional therapy. You're trying to reverse malnutrition. You want to treat your vitamin and mineral deficiencies maybe needing to refer to a um, registered dietitian who can assist with planning and patient preferences, and also a referral to a speech-language pathologist to determine if there's any aspiration risk or any interventions that would be needed around that issue. Um, also, an important thing is you really want to try to stop any dietary restrictions when you've got somebody who's malnourished, okay? Um, and the common approach would be to give liquid nutritional supplements, shakes, puddings, between meals to promote increased caloric intake. So things like Ensure Boost, Ensure Pudding, you have Mighty Shakes, um, and you could have some high, other types of high protein drinks. So nurses need to evaluate the compliance with these nutritional supplements. And you also want to promote any foods that are fortified with extra protein and calories. And the family role here is really important. Maybe making sure that the family is sharing meals with the older person and making sure that they are giving that older person their favorite foods. Um, so some common nutrient deficiencies include vitamin D because when we have decreased vitamin D, it causes muscle weakness, body sway, osteomalacia, and there is a tendency for falls with um, subsequent fractures. We typically would supplement with 800 um, international units per day. Vitamin B12 is a, another area where there's a lot of um, deficiency, and when we have a decreased vitamin 12, it, that causes neuro symptoms like uh, tingling of extremities, fatigue, irritability, depression, weakened concentration, and impaired memory. And typically we give that either injectable or oral one to two grams a day. Um, and of course these are all, these need to be prescribed by the doctor or nurse practitioner that nurses are not prescribing these on their own. Um, we also want to look at zinc supplementation um, we need zinc for protein synthesis and wound healing and skin repair and renewal. Typically 50 milligrams per day is recommended. Also iron if there is an anemia and typically ferrous sulfate 200 milligrams three times a day 
to try to replenish the iron store stores and we also may want to encourage the use of stool softeners because iron can cause constipation can also in some folks cause diarrhea so we need to be mindful of that assessment as well and they usually would continue an iron supplement for three months to correct a deficiency another area of nursing management would be a geriatric psych referral um, because we are concerned with dementia as a consequence of aging but also patient could have an underlying psychiatric disorder like bipolar disorder or some type of psychosis for which they may require medications and that may help in, in combating geriatric failure to thrive. Think about the side effects of antipsychotic meds um, which can result in weight loss. And you would want to seek, of course, for any potential medication um, issue around psychiatric medications, they need to consult. A psychiatrist would be best. Pharmacological therapy before initiating any, initiating any farm treatment, make sure you know the underlying causes of this need to be assessed and treated. Um, there are some medications that are off-label for appetite stimulation in geriatric failure to thrive. Megistrol is one of those medications. It is effective at higher doses. There is a potential, however, that this could increase the risk of thromboembolism. So we want to be mindful of that. It can also cause adrenal insufficiency and worsening of diabetes. It also puts the patient at risk for decreased bone density, bone loss, and fractures. So further research is indicated to determine patient safety and optimal dosing, and of course, as nurses, we would not be prescribing these, but we need to be mindful to assess for therapeutic and adverse effects. Mirtazapine is another medication you might see often prescribed for someone with um, appetite issues or geriatric failure to thrive. Mirtazapine is an antidepressant. Um, weight gain usually will occur early in therapy, but it is not effective for weight gain in people who are not depressed. Um, mirtazapine can also be used, you might see it used for sleep disturbances or anxiety. Another drug, dronabinol, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it is a Schedule three drug. It is actually THC, which is the major active component of cannabis. The FDA has approved um, this drug to treat age-related anorexia and refractory nausea and vomiting secondary to chemotherapies. It also can be used to improve disturbed behavior in Alzheimer's. You cannot crush this drug. And for geriatric failure to thrive patients, you want to give it 30 minutes before meals. You need to be cautious about using this drug in anyone with liver or seizure um, problems. It can have some CNS side effects like somnolence, emotional lability, and euphoria. Another classification of drugs that you might see um, prescribed are the anabolic, anabolic steroids. Um, some of the side effects may prohibit their use, can cause hyperglycemia, so in somebody with diabetes already, you want to be mindful of that. It can cause aggression, agitation, psychosis, and osteoporosis. Athletes use um, anabolic steroids to increase their muscle, muscle volume and strength. Um, so just to be mindful. Uh, any other drugs that may be prescribed for geriatric failure to thrive would be testosterone, growth hormone, and essential amino acids. Um, there's more research. Um, they're looking at more clinical research around using growth hormone um, in patients with geriatric failure to thrive. So monitoring and follow-up. You want to be looking at impaired physical function, maybe refer for physical therapy and occupational therapy um, so that they can make some recommendations for adaptive or assistive devices. You also may need referrals to neurology, rheumatology, and orthopedics if warranted. Uh, malnutrition, I think we just talked a lot about that with regard to um, making a referral for a registered dietitian 
depression, you continue to evaluate for depression and of course suicidal ideation. Evaluate the efficacy of antidepressant treatment. You may need to refer to a social worker, psychiatrist or psychologist if, if necessary. Cognitive impairment, remember that needs you need to be assessing cognitive status, mood, and their social setting at every interaction. And then maybe hospice would be indicated. If a person's BMI is less than 22 and there is significant physical uh, impairment that is causing disability, they may qualify for hospice. If the patient declines parental feeding or has not responded to nutritional supplementation despite adequate caloric intake, refer them to hospice. Um, you have to obtain terminal evaluations by two doctors along with an evaluation of competency in order for a person to become qualified for hospice. But once certified as terminal, um, you would want to meet with the patient and their health care proxy. It's really important to always meet with the, um, the patient and their health care proxy, the person they have designated as a person to make decisions for them in the event that they can't make them for themselves. And you want to make sure, you know, if you're working in hospice, discuss the hospice options um, for that type of care. And be mindful that the patient and their proxy may be shocked about the prognosis of the condition. So you have to kind of step gingerly here. Typically, it would be the physician who would kind of broach the topic of hospice, okay? So, I, you know, you want to be careful about bringing that up unless you've talked with the doctor, okay? So, um, you know, of course, with hospice, you have to have the um, patient or the healthcare proxy's um, decision to go to hospice before any um, decision is made, okay? So that pretty much wraps up um, geriatric failure to thrive and this little mini lecture. And again, I want to reiterate about, about the two articles on reserve. And if you should have any questions, please feel free to email either Dr. Master Polito or myself. Um, with any relevant questions um, here today. Thank you.